Hello, this is Craig here with a short little tute on plotting your resistivity data from the field. So, in the field, we put electrodes in the ground, we electrocuted earthworms, and somewhere along the way, we measured the resistivity of the soil and rock through which the current was passing. Now, the measurement we actually made, though, was we were looking at voltage and we were looking at current. And to calculate the resistance of the grounds, you do the ratio of volts over the current. So what we wrote down in the field was actually the resistance. Now that's fine, but resistance actually depends on the length that the current travels and the cross-section that it's actually traveling through. So you can imagine that if you put the electrodes in at different spacings, you're going to get different measures of resistance just because they're further away. And that's not what we want. We want to know the properties of the soil irrespective of how long our survey went for. And that property that we want that's not dependent on the length traveled is called the resistivity. So that's the difference between resistance and resistivity. Now, in a dipole, dipole survey, the positions of the electrodes are quite constrained. So we know the path in the ground the current's going to take at all times. And it looks something like this. This is from a simulation that we've done. This is uh, the sensitivity of the dipole-dipole array to the conductivity structure underneath. So we're sending a current into the ground on one side and reading the potentials of the other. Um, and this is basically what we'd be measuring is the bulk resistance of a path somewhere along in here. So knowing this lets us actually work out what the factor is to convert the distance cross-section into a resistivity measurement. And that factor that we use to convert from resistance to resistivity is called the geometric factor, also called K. The formula for K for a dipole-dipole survey is given right here. It's just pi times n, that's the spacing between electrodes we wrote down in our field notes, times n plus 1 times n plus 2, times A, which is the electrode spacing in our survey, which was just 10 meters for all the time. So to get the resistivity then, we do resistance times that geometric factor. And that will be the first calculation you do in a spreadsheet on your data. Right, so when you have your data, you'll notice in the field notes you wrote down where the two potential electrodes were, zero and 10 meters in this case where the two current electrodes were, 20 and 30 meters in this case, what n was, so that's the interval between here. Um, this is the multiple of electrode spacing that we have uh, in terms of distance between these. So for this one, we have 10 meters between P1 and C1. Our electrode spacing is 10 meters, therefore the multiple of that is one. When it's 20 meters between P1 and C1, that equals two. When it's 30 meters, that equals n equals three. Right, the other thing we wrote down in the field is the resistance, and this is just an example. You may have wrote down milliohms. You may have got something like 800 milliohms in the field for this configuration, and that's all we wrote in the field notes. Right, to convert, or to do the, resist, the resistance to resistivity calculation, we first have to convert from milliohms to ohms. So generally we do this by dividing by a thousand. So in your field notes that you're going to digitize, you will have to do this step for nearly all the measurements with the exception of possibly one. Just keep your eye open for the measurement that's written in ohms. Right, from there, we then calculate the geometric factor. So our next column here, I'm calculating K. Here's my formula. It's pi times E2, which is my distance value, N1 times E2 plus 1, times E2 plus 2, times 10, 10 being the electrode spacing. So that's the formula I gave you before. That goes in this next column. The next column I've got set up here in my spreadsheet is for midpoint. Now, we'll use this later on for plotting, and I'm just calculating it now. It's the average distance between our inner electrodes, P1 and C1. So here, P1's at 10 meters, C1's at 20 meters. My midpoint between them is 15. And I can calculate that just by doing the average as shown in this formula here. The last step then is to calculate the resistivity. And the resistivity is purely our resistance in ohms times this geometric factor will give us resistivity, which is my last column here. Okay, to go back to the field now for a second and what we actually did. We had four electrodes in the ground at a time. Two were potential, P1 and P2, measuring the potential along here. Two were C1 and C2, putting a current into the ground. Now, 
For this particular one, the spacing n equals 1 because I've got 10 meters between my electrodes here and 10 meters between these pairs of electrodes here, so n equals 1. Now, when I put the current into the ground, we're measuring the resistance of a path somewhere along here. It takes this sort of broad, weird-looking path. But when we write down our field data, if we want to plot a simple section as to what's going on, we actually, you know, we actually kind of approximate that path somewhat. Here's, here's the full gory details. If you do a simulation and look at where the sensitivity is to what rocks if that we're actually measuring in here, you can see we're measuring the resistivity in a dipole-dipole array. You know, I've got electrode here, 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 and here. It follows this path here, but we can kind of assume we're measuring the resistivity of somewhere in the middle. Now, for other different types of resistivity arrays, and I've shown, I've shown a few other examples just here, you get different shaped resistivity combinations. And they're sensitive to different layers and different depths. Dipole-dipole does quite well looking deeper into the ground. So for us, anyway, let's assume when we've done the measurement, we're kind of getting the resistivity of somewhere, something somewhere in the average of the distance between it. So we're going to assume we've measured a point just there. So that's our first reading, making up this pseudo section. Next step then was we moved our current electrodes further along. So now our distance between P1 and C1 is 20 meters, and in that case, N equals two. So our electrode spacing is 10 meters. We times that by two, we get 20 meters, which is the distance between the two there. We applied a current to the ground, and it follows that sort of path there, and we're basically getting an average resistivity of somewhere along this path, which let's assume it occurs just here, and we'll plot that up here. Now we have two measurements for resistivity going into the ground. This was our first measurement, which was closer in and between the inner electrodes here. This is our second measurement. Our midpoint shifted along to the right because our current uh, electrodes are further out, and we're also seeing deeper into the ground now because they're further apart. If we move them again, n equals 3 now, so our distance between them is 30 meters, and you can see we're seeing deeper again, and if I shuffle them out to n equals 4, we'll get a point somewhere down here. So as I'm moving these current electrodes out and I'm jumping them out, I'm taking readings progressively deeper into the ground, but you can see they're sort of sloping. My midpoint between the two electrodes is moving as well. Then let's say we've gone too far, we're not getting readings anymore. The next step is to shuffle P1 and P2 up 10 meters now and do it all again. So here we take another reading along this next little bit and it will occur at that midpoint here. If I shuffle C1 again, our next reading is there. Shuffle C1, C2 again, third reading is there. And if I get up to N equals 4, my fourth reading is there. Right, now if we continue that electrode jumping all the way, we'll end up with a data set that looks something like this. And this is something we call a pseudo section. So for each of these resistance measurements I've made thus far, I have a midpoint, so the point sort of in the middle of the path of the, that the resistance was measured on. Um, and then an N, this is the electrode spacing number. This is my electrodes that were close in. These are my electrodes that were further apart. And we assume that the further apart ones are actually seeing deeper into the ground. So we could plot it up this way and assume this approximates what's going on in the ground fairly roughly. Now the other complication here is that these different points we've measured have different resistivities. Some might be low here, some might be high here. And what we generally do to a data set that has values like this is we contour it up. We've only got discrete measurements at different points, so we could contour that and get an idea of what the different resistivity domains are in this data. So how can we do that? We're going to carry on with Excel because it's a tool available to everyone. And what we should have at this point in your Excel spreadsheet are three columns that look something like this, a midpoint, um, your N and your resistivity, which we calculated previously. So why don't you start up a new sheet, so you can just do add sheet at the bottom in Excel, and then we're going to re-plot these things, not as columns, but as a sort of an array that that replicates the resistivity pseudo section structure. So what we're going to have up here is our midpoints going across here. So for our midpoints, you remember we started with 0 to 10 meters for the potential and 20 to 30. So my first midpoint is in between 10 and 20, which is 15 meters. 
And as we progressed along, we increased the midpoint each time. So for this particular reading here, for instance, with the potentials of 10 and 20, we wrote down a resistivity for n equals 1 of 150. And this is just an example. This is not your data. If I then increased the current spacing, it goes up to 30 to 40 meters. My midpoint then is 20. n equals 2. My resistivity reading that I've calculated is 151. If I increase that again up to, let's say, 40 meters uh, distance between, so 40 to, sorry, 40 to 50, um, then my midpoint shifts up again. I get 95 for n equals 3. And then lastly, if I'm at 50 to 60 for the current, and maybe the potential is still at 0 to 10, my midpoint then is 30 meters, and I get a reading for n equals 4, somewhere down here at 70. Now, when I shift my potentials up, to the next reading, you'll notice something interesting happens. My potentials move to 10 to 20 meters. My current goes to 30 to 40 meters, and my midpoint for that starts at 25 meters for the next little step down. And you can see my pseudo section staggering down as we go, much like the data I showed you earlier in the little schematic. It kind of goes down these diagonals as we go. And you can build up a pseudo section. Your one will have more values in it than this. Now you can see the issue with this for Excel is that we've actually got little gaps in our data here. Now, normally in a proper geophysics program or in a Python code, you'd you'd interpolate over those gaps properly and fill it out so you had a, a decent pseudo section. In Excel, we have to do a slight little fudge. So the easiest sneaky way to do this in Excel without mucking things up too much is actually just fill in those gaps because Excel won't plot them up. It won't like the fact there's no numbers in here. So we'll just do an average. So if we've got a gap in our data, let's average the value on the left and the value on the right and put it in here. And if you copy that formula then into all the places we had a blank, here, 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 and down the bottom here where 92 is highlighted, you can just copy the formula. It will work out that average value and you can see we've got a nice regularly structured data set now. Now we are ready to plot. So. In Excel, select, select all that data that you've got there, and then go to your charts. And what you're looking for, I found them somewhere under this waterfall menu in my version, um, are your surface plots. And under your surface plot sections, we have these contour plots. This is a filled contour. This is a wireframe unfilled contour. For the next example, I've selected that, but play around with them and see what your data looks like under either one. Now, when you plot it up, you'll have to change some things in your graph. The first thing I did was right click on the right axis and go to format axis and invert it. So it's actually looking down. It's now going one to five in this direction rather than going the opposite direction. Um, if you don't change that, your pseudo section will be upside down, which you don't really want. Um, but once you do that, you can play around in chart design to have a look at different color schemes. You can try field or non-field contours. Um, play with the chart formatting whatnot. But what we're looking for is a nice, clear representation of your field data in a chart form, in a, uh, in a contoured chart in Excel. And that is what you're going to put into your uh, report and what you're going to interpret. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit fancier with the field data once it is digitized, and that I'm going to actually create a full inversion of that. And the way the full inversion works, it doesn't just assume that you're measuring a point in the middle of that resistance path. It takes into account that the resistance path covers a wide area and tries to, tries to create a best fit model that incorporates all that information about the way the path moves. So that's a huge step up in complexity and not something I'm going to bog you down with. So I'll just give you the result of that. But for you guys, I want you to do the simple way, which is to actually plot up contoured pseudo sections for your report. So you can try and identify where in the ground uh, conductivity anomalies are and what you can see. All right, that's it for me. Good luck with the pseudo sections and I'll be there to help you when you compile your field report data.